What you're looking at here is the unfinished China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a project that was initially introduced with an astounding budget of $60 billion. Similarly, Kenya launched a railway project with a budget of $3.2 billion, which also remains incomplete. Similar high-cost megaprojects have been launched all around the world, with one thing in common. They are either unfinished or completely abandoned. But what was the purpose of these billion-dollar projects? And why do these countries invest billions of dollars in such ambitious projects in the first place? Well, all these projects are the brainchild of the CCP, which were introduced as a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, a massive intercontinental project by President Xi Jinping in 2013. Nearly 150 countries signed up for this project, and it had a shocking budget of more than $5 trillion. This was supposed to be the biggest infrastructural project the world had ever seen. But how did once dubbed as the project of the century become a failure of the century? Around 2000 years ago, during China's Han Dynasty, they came up with the idea of the Silk Road. It was like an ancient highway for trading stuff, and it stretched for over 4,000 miles from China to the Mediterranean, going through Europe and Eurasia. This road made Central Asia a big deal in the world trade scene. China sent things like fancy silk, tasty spices, beautiful jade, and other cool stuff to the West. And in return, they got gold, precious metals, ivory, and glass stuff. It worked really well, like a smooth running machine. It was pretty much perfect, but you might wonder why it eventually disappeared. Well, that's a whole different story we won't get into here. The important thing is that it brought a lot of money and growth to Central Asia. So, when President Xi announced a plan to bring back the Silk Road, it made a lot of sense. In 2013, during a visit to Kazakhstan, leaders wanted to get closer with other countries in Euroasia and do more stuff together. They had a cool idea to make an economic belt along the Silk Road. This was a big project, but it would help people in all the countries along the way. They called this idea the Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI for short. The plan had two parts. One was about building stuff over land, like railways, pipes for energy, roads, and easier ways to cross borders. They wanted to go west into the mountainous countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union and South to countries like Pakistan, India, and the rest of Southeast Asia. This part was called the Belt. There were big projects, like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, where they planned to spend a lot of money on things like power plants, wind farms, roads, and a super-fast train between Peshawar and Karachi. There was also a big train project in Kenya that cost over $4 billion and a power plant in Tajikistan that cost around $350 million, among other projects. So, they were basically working on making things better for everyone by connecting countries and building important stuff. Now, let's talk about the road part. Even though it's not really a road, it's more like sea routes. These sea routes connect China to places like Southeast Asia, Africa and Europe. China is spending a lot of money on ports in different parts of the world, like Sri Lanka, Dubai, Djibouti, Greece, Spain, and even Peru. This helps more people use China's money, called the renminbi, and makes it easier for countries in Asia to work together. In 2013, at a meeting with some Southeast Asian countries in Indonesia, Xi announced a plan called the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road as part of the BRI people got really excited about it. The Belt and Road Initiative was a big project that could make the world economy much better, like $7.1 trillion better by the year 2040. It did this by making things like roads and bridges better. This made it easier for countries to trade with each other. It was a win-win because developing countries got better things like roads and ways to trade, and developed countries got to sell their things to new markets and buy cheaper stuff. More than 150 countries, which is like two-thirds of the world's people and 40% of the world's money, said they wanted to join in on these projects, or at least thought about it. Some countries, like Saudi Arabia, Hungary and Singapore, got a lot out of it. They wanted to finish all this work by the year 2049, which is also when China's People's Republic will be 100 years old. 
Xi Jinping, the leader, said it's all about connecting places and making a brighter future. Now, let's talk about why some people got suspicious. If you know anything about the Chinese government, you'd agree that they don't usually talk about making things better and brighter for everyone. Also, did we mention that all of this would cost somewhere between three and eight trillion dollars? Obviously, there must be more to this big project and trade is probably the first thing that comes to mind. But all this global interconnectedness and trillions of dollars involved mean the Belt and Road Initiative is definitely political. But how political? To really understand, we have to go back to 2012, a year before the BRI was initially announced and the same year that Xi Jinping came into power. You see, around this time, China's strategic, economic and diplomatic relations with the world were deeply troubled. Strategically, its territorial and military conflicts in the South China Sea and the East China Sea had become impossible to ignore. So, in a way, implementing the BRI was part of a strategic China Goes West proposal to de-escalate head-on conflicts in Maritime Asia by intensifying connectivity in Eurasian land. Economically, China's economy had expanded quickly before this time, but perhaps too quickly. You see, industries like construction had grown tremendously during China's economic boom, so much so that they had serious trouble finding customers. If China was to have any hope of becoming a global economic power, it would need to look outside its borders for new markets to sell to. So, China was becoming bigger than just a factory for the world's manufacturing. But the young population that fueled China's past growth was getting old, and the CCP's one-child policy had made a huge dent in China's future population. The future was bleak, growth was slowing down. So, the young, ambitious newcomer Xi Jinping launched the most ambitious project in history to undo the damage that CCP's policies had done. For Xi, the BRI would promote economic growth and connectivity, expand China's influence, secure access to resources, and promote China's image. He even bragged that Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative was the project of the century, something that would alter the global balance of power and influence. But 10 years later, even though Beijing has refused to acknowledge the failure, it isn't anywhere near what Xi had planned. But what happened? Now, here we go. Now let's talk about some big examples of the BRI, like the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a bunch of projects that connect China to Pakistan's Gwada port in the Arabian Sea. But here's the thing, it's not easy to find all the details about the BRI. There's no official list of everything and everyone involved, but people think there are around 2,600 projects in more than 100 countries. And this raised some concerns. At first, people thought the BRI would benefit both Chinese companies and the countries receiving help. It sounded like a win-win situation. But the way they invested money didn't really work well. Why? Well, first of all, many of the countries involved didn't have enough money to pay for these projects. A lot of them were either poor or still developing. So, China said, no problem, we'll lend you the money without asking too many questions. Here's how it went. Step 1. China gave a lot of money to developing countries to help them build important things like roads and stuff. These countries were kind of tired of dealing with Western countries and groups like the World Bank. See, those guys always wanted to check if the projects would actually work, if there was any corruption going on, what the impact on the environment would be, and so on. Plus, even after all that, there was no guarantee they'd give you the money. But China was different. They'd lend you money quickly, without making a fuss and without any conditions. Step 2. Countries take the money and start building stuff. But there's a twist. Most of the work and skills come from Chinese companies. So, the developing countries use China's loans and hire Chinese firms to do the work. Eventually, they have to pay back the money to China and they need to pay interest like you would with any loan. Also, Chinese companies that couldn't find much work in China found new opportunities in places like Africa and Asia. And, as you can imagine, this creates issues later on. Step 3. Once all the new stuff is built, 
there's a big economic boost in Asia, Africa and Europe. And guess who's in the perfect spot to control the flow of goods on the new trains, ports and roads? The Chinese companies that built them. So, in a way, China quietly became a part of every important global supply chain. Mission accomplished. It sounded good on paper, and many countries signed up for it. I mean, why wouldn't they? China was giving away a lot of money without asking too many questions. They made deals and started working on projects. But here's where China hit its first problem. Chinese diplomats, businessmen and politicians started wondering, who's really in charge here? Was it the big government-owned companies, the foreign affairs ministry, or maybe the commerce and finance ministries? Nobody was quite sure, and this created a mess with too much bureaucracy. Chinese authorities approved some projects that seemed questionable and ended up not making economic sense. Before they could figure out the first problem, another issue came up. It turns out that the local leaders in many of these developing countries had some pretty unreasonable demands. Let's take an example, the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. India and the United States didn't want to pay for it because they didn't think it was a good idea, at least from an economic perspective. But China decided to fund it anyway, even though the people in Sri Lanka weren't so sure about it either. They already had the Colombo port, which handled most of their maritime trade. But the new Hambantota port just happened to be in the hometown of President Mahinda Rajapaksa. What a coincidence, right? In the years that followed, Chinese supporters started giving money to President Rajapaksa's election campaigns. Another coincidence? It might not sound great, but it's hard to say if it's really corruption. But here's the thing, at least 47 projects worth a total of $41.2 billion in 10 countries have been linked to claims of corruption, controversies or rule-breaking, according to Aid Data and the World Bank. When it comes to transport projects, bribes might make up 5 to 20% of the overall project costs. Researchers also found that 35% of all Belt and Road projects faced issues like corruption problems, violations of workers' rights, environmental risks and protests from the public. But here's the surprising part. China isn't really bothered by all of this, and that's been the trend with the Belt and Road Initiative. China promised less control and ended up not controlling anything at all. The COVID-19 pandemic worsened the situation by increasing debt and impacting China's economy due to reduced exports. The Belt and Road Initiative also faced criticism for its carbon emissions, pressuring China to make it more environmentally friendly, despite its heavy reliance on fossil fuels. Additionally, Russia's Ukraine invasion disrupted vital train routes, causing supply chain issues. This, along with questionable project choices, hasty deals and Chinese company contracts, left many developing countries with massive debts, including Pakistan, Laos, Mongolia, Kyrgyzstan, Djibouti, Montenegro, Tajikistan and the Maldives, totaling 42 countries owing China over 10% of their GDP. Another big problem with the BRI is how the loans work. Imagine you're a developing country and you go to the World Bank and the IMF for money. They give you the money, but they also tell you what to do with your economy. But with China, they give you money with very little paperwork and it seems like they're your saviour. But once you sign the deal, you realise they weren't there to save you. They were more like loan sharks. Think about it. The World Bank and Western lenders usually give loans to developing countries with an interest rate of 1-3% to and a long time to pay them back, like 30 years. But the Chinese loans come with high interest, like 7%, and they want the money back in only 15 years. So, let's say you had this great project funded by Dreams and Chinese money, but now you can't pay the huge loans. You ask China for help, and they agree, but it comes at a cost. They might want valuable land, an important port, or even a military base. Before you know it, China ends up with military bases and crucial ports in countries that owe them money. Take Sri Lanka, for example. They couldn't manage their debt to China, so a Chinese government-owned company called CM Port took control of the Hambantota port on a lease. Then, when COVID-19 hit, things got even worse for Sri Lanka. 
they had fewer tourists and they had to spend more on energy. It got so bad that Sri Lanka's economy collapsed and they had to ask the IMF for help in 2022. In the end, China still came out ahead, even if it seemed like they lost. This kind of situation, where countries can't handle their Chinese debt, has made people worry that China is using its money to gain more power in the region. And it seems like Africa, with many poor and developing countries and a history of corrupt politics, is the next target. For example, China wanted to build a super expensive train system in Kenya that was supposed to make travel faster. But it ran into problems. The railway ended up costing a lot of money to operate and Kenya had to stop the Chinese company from managing it. There were so many corruption allegations that it became a big issue in the Kenyan presidential election. Now, Kenya owes China $4.7 billion if they want to finish the project. Now, China is dealing with financial problems within its own country, and people are worried about how stable its economy is. Some rich Chinese people are looking for opportunities in other countries because they want a more secure future. Also, many companies that used to make things in China are moving to other places like India and Vietnam, which is causing more trouble for China's economy. All of these things, along with other reasons, have made people doubt whether the Belt and Road Initiative will be successful. It was once seen as a huge project, but now it's facing a lot of challenges and uncertainties. The problems along the way have raised questions about whether it can really work in the long run. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more weekly investment tips. Leave a comment below. Happy investing.